Hello everyone, I have the pleasure today to present our paper Cellular Enabled Wearables in Public Safety Network State-of-the-Art and Performance Evaluation authored by me, Salva Safi, Associated Professor Yuji Hoshek and Aneta Kolakova. So the outline of this presentation will be structured as followed. We will start by the migration from land mobile radio to cellular systems for public safety. Then we will talk about some of the cellular features that were introduced by the third generation partnership project, aka 3GPP, for public safety. The next part will be dedicated to the role of wearable devices in public safety services under the concept of the Internet of Life Saving Things, IOLST. After these parts related to the state of the art, we will discuss the performance evaluation scenarios, parameters and results, and finally we will summarize the essential findings of this work in the conclusion. Conventionally, public safety organizations utilize dedicated communication systems based on the land mobile radio LMR technologies, including terrestrial ranked radio, tetrapole, and P25 of the Association of Public Safety Communication Officials. The main services that are offered by these networks are voice-centric services, and they involve first responders to be equipped with push-to-talk devices. Now, to answer the question of why moving towards cellular systems for public safety, this migration can be actually justified by two main arguments. From one side, and similarly to other industries, public safety bodies are always targeting next levels of operational efficiency by enabling new broadband data applications on top of the voice-centric services that, that they usually um, offer. And from the other side, they have these commercial cellular networks with already mature multi-vendor and multi-service infrastructures. So this public safety service expansion and deployment cost optimization are the main motivations behind selecting cellular systems, more precisely long-term evolution LTE technology, to be the basis for future public safety implementations. This selection was aligned with the introduction of certain features specifically for public safety by 3GPP starting from its release 12 with the proximity services and device-to-device -device communication support via the definition of the sidelink interface. In terms of applications, 3GPP extended the set of public safety services by introducing mission critical push to talk in release 13 and then mission critical data and video in release 14. The evolution of cellular networks from 4G to 5G brought also further enhancements for NR sidling in terms of proximity services and device-to-device -device configurations and mission-critical service enhancements in 3GPP uh, release 15 and beyond. Other 5G concepts or features that were not exclusive for public safety but that can be employed in cellular-based public safety networks include the IoT device adoption and also 5G positioning with its potential uh, boost in the localization accuracy that can be beneficial especially in tracking applications. This figure summarizes the main cellular features that can be considered as beneficial for public safety use cases for different key performance indicators, like multi-RAT and multi-connectivity for reliability, device-to-device -device communications and their three gains of hop reuse and proximity, software-defined networking for security and latency, small cells and beamforming for capacity improvements. Now, to position the role of wearable devices in public safety networks and applications, we first present the context of Internet of Life-Saving Things, which can be defined as the network of devices collecting data and using various communication technologies to share it in real time for the improvement of public safety responses to emergencies. Similarly to the IoT concept, IULST involves various devices in multiple use cases, such as real-time video sharing using body-worn cameras, healthcare monitoring of first responders, and traffic system control using sensor-equipped vehicles and drones. And as you can remark, wearables are part of several use cases and are gaining the attention of public safety organizations thanks to the potential benefits that come along their deployment, such as workforce mobility and hands-free operation. By this, we conclude the state-of-the-art overview and we move to the next part of the paper, which is the performance evaluation. 
In this part, we investigated the performance of wearable-based mission-critical application. To be more specific, it's a simulation-based performance evaluation that we carried on the Network Simulator 3, more precisely on LENA module, that was updated by the National Institute of Standards and Technology with public safety-related scenarios and models. What we modeled in NS3 for evaluation are off-network mission-critical push-to-talk group calls with out-of-coverage uh, users. In 3GPP release 13, two functional modes were defined for the mission-critical push-to-talk applications. And on network mode where a client server setup is used and established via the core network, and an off-network mode where the communications are supported only by user equipments in a peer-to-peer -peer setup. Here we modeled the off-network MCPTT mode with out-of-coverage users, which is a typical scenario for real-life uh, public safety operations. By users here we mean public safety personnel equipped with cellular-enabled smartwatches and specifically LTE CATAN2 smartwatches, which is a device category for the cellular low-power wide area technology LTEM. On top of the support of D2D communications and NS3, we extended LENA module by features for the modeling of public safety scenarios and wearable device capabilities. For instance, we use the 700 MHz frequency band for public safety deployments in cellular networks. And to capture the signal propagation between smartwatches, we used an empirical off-body propagation loss model. In terms of capability reduction of wearable devices, we updated the um, adaptive modulation and coding model with the recommendations of 3GPP for the bandwidth reduced low complexity or BL user equipments where the main baseband parameters are maximum bandwidth of 5 MHz, a maximum modulation order of 16 QAM and a single uh, transmission and reception antenna. Now, in terms of performance assessment of the smartwatch-based MCPTT, we utilized the key performance indicator that was defined by 3GPP for this type of applications, which is the MCPTT access time, defined as the time interval between a request to join a group call and the reception of call joining confirmation. What we wanted to do in this part is to follow the average access time results in function of different parameters and do, to get inferences of their impacts. The first parameters to test were the device categories and capabilities. More specifically, we compared the average access time to an MCPTT application established between two LTE Category 1 smartphones and two LTE CATAM2 smartwatches. As expected, the first device category outperforms the LTE CATAM2 smartwatches, mainly due to the difference in the supported bandwidth, thus the difference in the number of physical resource blocks that can be allocated for siting and device-to-device -device communications. The next MCPTT access time results are in terms of sidling related parameters, mainly PACCH period and PACCH length. PSCH is the physical sidling control channel that is ratified by 3GPP alongside with the physical sidling shared channel as the control and data channels for sidling. The PSCH period is the parameter that defines the periodicity of the sidling rent configuration performed by each user equipment, and the PSCH length is the number of sub subframes dedicated to the control, since during one PSCH period we have subframes for control and subframes for data, so this number needs to be fixed. As a first observation, longer PACCH periods result in longer access time values, and this can be justified by the fact that there is a component in the access time formula that is called floor request retransmission, and it's equal to the PACCH period according to the 3GPP recommended settings. The second observation is related to the PACCH length, where even the small gaps in the access time results show that preferring shared over control transmissions can provide shorter access time values. The third and last D2D related parameter that we focused on in the performance evaluation is the sidling grant scheduling method which is the method that user equipment use to fix the number of physical resource blocks, the number of transmission opportunities, and the modulation encoding scheme before each device-to-device -device communication. 
It can be prefixed in the simulation or it can be performed following certain optimization goals such as maximizing the communication range or minimizing the number of physical resource blocks utilized per transmission. These optimized methods show a better performance in terms of access time values and for different number of users per group call. Summarizing the main contributions of this paper, we first provided a state-of-the-art overview of cellular-enabled wearables and public safety networks, and we discussed several public safety use cases where utilizing wearable technology can help in the delivery of improved safety and situational awareness for first responders. The second part of the paper dealt with the Nexus Time Performance Evaluation of an MCBTT application using LTE CATAM2 enabled smartwatches, where we tested different combinations of device capability and D2D related parameters and their impacts on the access time values in mission critical push to talk applications. A future perspective and continuation of this work can be the latency and reliability trade off in wearable based mission critical push to talk applications. Finally, we acknowledge funding from the European Union Horizon 2020 Mercury eWare Research Program. Thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to ask and initiate the discussion about this work.